Алло, док куда? Раз, два, раз, два, раз, два, три, четыре, пять. Раз, два, раз, два. Раз, два, три, четыре, пять.
Hello, is it clear now? Oh, wonderful. Uh, yes, it's on. Okay, good. Testing, testing. I'm on channel one. Yeah. Maybe my volume is down. Okay. No, because this was turned on. Okay, good. I think we are we're going to start now. Uh, I don't know if we. Testing, one, two, testing, can you hear? Can everybody else hear this? Yes. John, you just have, you have a bad this unit. Is a, this is a dub. I will try this. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning. Welcome to this workshop. Uh, before we start, uh, I just need to make sure that all my panelists are here. Uh, I'm just missing one of them. Uh, let me contact him and find out where he is. And if uh, there is no sign of from him, we will get started soon. Oh, <laughs> here he is. Give a big hand to John. Uh, sorry, uh, to, <laughs> to Richard. Okay, so good morning again. Uh, welcome to this workshop. My name is Anjan Bose, and I'm from Ekpat International. Uh, the title of the workshop is Innovative Applications uh, to Facilitate Child Online Protection. And before we explain uh, what, what, what we are going to do in this session, uh, let me introduce my panelists first. Uh, to start with, I have Jacqueline Boucher from uh, Microsoft. She is the Director General, uh, sorry, the Director of Trustworthy Computing with Microsoft. Yeah, I made you Director General. That's a new title you have. <laughs> okay, and then uh, to my left, uh, uh, we have, probably we are not going to follow the sequence when we are presenting, but since they are seated in this way, it's better for me to introduce serially. Uh, we have Susie Henry, uh, who is the director of public policy at GSMA. And uh, we will hear a lot about you know, what the mobile industry is doing on this issue. On my right, we have Larry Maggot, who is the co-director uh, of Connect Safely, and he's the, also the founder of um, Safety, how, how do you call it? Safekids.com. And uh, we had heard from Ann Collier yesterday, who is also from uh, Connect Safely, um, we'll get a different perspective from Larry today. Um, on to my right, uh, next to Larry, we have John Carr, who probably doesn't need any introduction. We have seen him a number of times. He has different number of hats. <laughs> and uh, currently in this panel, uh, I want to introduce him as the expert advisor of INAXO, which is the European NGO Alliance for Child safety online. And um, finally, the last speaker, uh, but not the least for sure, is Richard Allen. And uh, Richard, uh, would you like to um, explain your title, please? Because I didn't have it in writing. Uh, I'm the Director of uh, Public Policy for Europe, Middle East, and Africa at Facebook. Thank you very much, Allen. And um, just to get us all started, I think, um, I will just give you a very brief introduction about what kind of thematic issue we are going to cover uh, during the next uh, one hour or so. Um, 
With the logistics, let me explain that we will have five speakers, one, two, three, four, five. Each one of them will have a presentation, and at the end of the session, we will have a Q&A. But during any time during the discussions, their presentations, if you have any issue that you feel you need to raise during the session, please don't feel shy to raise your hand. Um, so I will repeat, presentation first, and then we have the Q&A at the end. But any time during the presentations or after they finish, if you think there is an intervention that's urgent and required, please raise your hand, okay? And coming back to the session content, I would like to start with the saying, we are talking about child online protection, but the premise for that is, you know, whether the child abuse images that we are going to talk about, the, you know, the interactions of different stakeholders related to this offense. The child abuse images are a scene of crime. To us, it's something that reflects the abuse, the exploitation, and also the humiliation of human rights and child rights. And if we keep that in mind before we get the discussion started, I think many of the statements, many of the issues, many of the complications will make sense. And if we can revolve our, our discussions, keeping in mind that we are trying to prevent and protect children from a heinous crime. So what we are going to talk about this in this session is how industry, how other stakeholders who are supporting the industry, the technology industry, can help in the detection of this crime. And once the incident is reported, how can this process be expedited? You know, how can it be accelerated so that law enforcement has enough intelligence to act quickly? And we will also talk about what are the innovations in the technology industry that is aiding us, that is helping us to move in that direction. We know, we heard from uh, law enforcement in different sessions uh, across the world that it's becoming overwhelming. The number of images that are being produced, the channels, the distribution channels that are being used for their distribution is beyond the capacity of law enforcement alone. So they need intelligence, they need support from the community. And in this workshop, what we are trying to do we have all the big names around us. We have the industry leaders with us. What are the different ways they can help us? They're already doing a lot. They're already engaged in initiatives, uh, providing tools, software tools, working with law enforcement. But how can we push that boundary? What are some of the processes that have already started? You know, we know industry has uh, methods and detection patterns for uh, detecting crimes other forms of crimes like phishing, like online crimes, terrorism, and so on. Uh, we will talk about how much we can use technology, what are the boundaries with privacy issues, uh, what are the public policy statements that need to be framed in that context so that e technology industry can drive their efforts in, you know, to match with that. So rather than me um, preempting all the discussions that they are going to share with you, I will open up the floor. Um, I will start the uh, session with uh, Jacqueline from Microsoft, and she has a presentation. Uh, she will lead us through what Microsoft is doing in the context of child online protection and some of the partnership they're already having. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Thank you, Anjan, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you and talk about this important topic. In the interest of time, I'm going to uh, move forward through a couple of slides pretty quickly. Anjan, did you want to show those, or should I just move it along? We don't have to. Uh, 
So I work in a group in Microsoft called uh, Trustworthy Computing. This is the group that is focused on security and privacy and online safety, among other things. And I'm also coming to you um, from one of the US uh, organizations that I'm a part of. Uh, I'm the vice chair currently of the US National Cybersecurity Alliance. And that's one thing that I'd like to discuss with you, that organization and some others that we work with. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach in the sense that I'd like to talk about public-private partnerships in addition to some of the technology that Microsoft provides. So our approach to these issues, any online safety or security issues, involves our discussion of uh, and what we bring to the table in terms of technological tools and education and guidance. That is where my group specifically works in providing education and guidance to a variety of audiences and also our partnerships. And that could be partnerships with, the in with others in industry, with governments, with NGOs, others in the community, everyone working together toward what we call providing a safer, more trusted internet. And specifically with respect to the public-private partnerships, it's essential that when you're trying to raise awareness of online safety, child protection, all the complexities of cybercrime, in including uh, child predation, public-private partnerships are so essential. We need to, to have government leaders coming together, technology providers coming together, NGOs coming together, all playing a vital role. So I just want to take you through two of the key partners that we work with in the US. And again, please. One of them, as I mentioned, is the National Cybersecurity Alliance. This is a nonprofit in the US, and it is funded in large part by the US Department of Homeland Security. They focus on empowering and supporting digital citizens to use the internet safely and in a secure manner, thereby protecting themselves and the cyber infrastructure. They raise awareness, they create guidance, they drive consumers to action. Children and, and protecting young people online is a key component of what the Cybersecurity Alliance is all about. They use what we call a trusted source model, and they're harmonizing messages from all across industry and government, NGOs, and so forth. And all of their work is really grounded in foundational research and data. <clears throat> Some of their key initiatives our National Cybersecurity Awareness Month that takes place every year in the month of October. There are many organizations in the US, Facebook included, Google included, that are part of this organization. Another big initiative is what they call Stop, Think, Connect, which is their very actionable message to consumers, to children, to everyone online. Before you're getting online, take that moment and pause and think about what you're going to do, and then make that connection with someone, with content, whatever the case may be. This was developed by 25 companies and seven federal agencies in the US, and as I mentioned, some of the other participants in Stop, Think, Connect, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Verizon, AT&T, a host of US government agencies and departments as well. In terms of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which I mentioned uh, first, I think it's important to point out that eight European countries participated just this last month, last October, in a pilot project for a European Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And I think that's very, very important because a lot of this work is going to be rooted in education and awareness. and guiding the public, guiding children, youth, others toward what we want them to do, what kind of behaviors we want them to observe when they go online. Data Privacy Day, I'm sure that probably doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, but the National Cybersecurity Alliance is now the US shepherd for that effort in the United States. They just took that over about a year ago. And then finally, another one that, uh, of their initiatives that is very important is the National Cybersecurity Education Council. And this is another public-private partnership basically to formalize education of digital citizens and cybersecurity professionals to make sure that our children from preschool all the way up through graduate school and then people who are working in this field have the education and the tools and resources that they need to succeed in the 21st century and to make sure that the government and, and others are adequately skilled and, and aware of what needs to be accomplished in terms of uh, producing and, and, and growing in, in, our, in our new uh, digital culture. The next slide is just um, some key resources. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. We can just move through. And I'd like to talk about one other organization that we work with. Um, many of you may know the Family Online Safety Institute. Again, uh, Facebook, Google, 
others uh, across the industry are also a part of it. And my colleague here, uh, Kim Sanchez, is the current vice chair of that organization, having completed a two-year term as uh, as the chair. And and you'll hear from you'll hear from Richard later, who is the current chair that uh, that followed Kim in that position. So FOSI is an international nonprofit. It works to make make the world safer for, for children and for families. Two of their key initiatives that I'd point out would be the Global Resources Information Directory. This is a comprehensive com compendium of online information that monitors, tracks, and provides commentary on national initiatives in countries and regions to help make the internet safer for its citizens. And a new tool that FOSI just launched a couple of months ago is this Platform for Good. And it's, it's basically looking at education and awareness and, and online safety in a very positive light and focusing youth and families on uh, what the good the internet can provide because obviously today we're going to be talking about a lot of other harms that can come from it. Next slide please Anjan. Um, there's just a few resources here uh, from FOSI but the key one is their website FOSI.org. So when you hear from Microsoft, you probably think largely about the technological innovations and investments that the company makes. So I'd like to spend the, the bulk of my time here in working with our partnerships with law enforcement and what we do for law enforcement. So again, taking this notion of public-private partnership just a little bit further. So I think we could all agree that globally, law enforcement is doing admirable work to help combat child online exploitation, um, but the scale of that problem, as Anjan said earlier, really requires broader cooperation. Again, bringing in law enforcement, government, industry, NGOs, academia, and others. So Microsoft works with law enforcement agencies worldwide to develop tools to support their important work in the fight of exploitation of children online. One such example would be our KETS tool, which has been around for quite some time. You might be very familiar with KETS, C-E-T-S, and that stands for the Child Exploitation Tracking System. It helps law enforcement investigators share and analyze information related to criminal acts, such as the processing and distribution of pornography, kidnapping, physical and sexual abuse of children. and. The hot topic um, when you talk about Microsoft in, in this space is, of course, photo DNA. It's among one of the latest tools that Microsoft has contributed to this fight uh, of these illegal images. It was developed by Microsoft Research in collaboration with Dartmouth College. And photo DNA was turned over to the U.S. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in 2009. But it started as something very different at Microsoft a few years prior to that. Microsoft actually wasn't thinking about law enforcement when it initially was thinking about photo DNA. It emerged from conversations with other online service providers. The providers were finding it very difficult, uh, given the available hash technologies, to find matches of images of child pornography. So the previous existing hash technology was MD5 and SHA, and these hashes required absolute matches. So when you would you would look for a photo, it would have to have be exactly the same to find an a match of that um, uh, a copy of that original photo. So even the slightest difference, such as the size of the photo or the file format, would indicate a non-match with these other technologies. So when photo DNA came along. 98.7%, that's a really staggering statistic, but 98.7% of photo DNA's matches never would have been made with the previous technologies of MD5 and SHA. So in short, what photo DNA is, it helps to refine and automate the search for child pornography among the billions of photos that are on the internet. And its aim is to stop the online distribution of child pornography images in the first instance and to help address the spread of these images overall online. So we can just push through this uh, build of this slide, but how photo DNA works is a mathematical algorithm and it creates a unique signature for an image. It works very much like the previous technologies and that 
signature can be used to find copies of the original image. So a photo DNA hash, or that signature, is essentially created by sizing the image to a standard size for processing, turning the image into black and white, what they call grayscale, breaking the image into sections, and then calculating a unique number to represent each of those individual sections of the image, putting all those numbers together, and then creating a single code that uniquely represents that image. And again, depending on file formats and what have you, just as long as, as the, the hash matches, you're not going to have to be bothered by these, these subtle differences or subtle changes in the photos. You will come up with uh, a, a copy of the original image that has been found. Photo DNA is actually agnostic to what the picture depicts. All it knows is how to create a unique signature that represents that image. So that, that you are able to look for the same signature elsewhere. So I have got two minutes left and I would like to uh, just push forward to say that this technology was turned over to NECMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in the US in 2009. And as probably all of you, if not um, many of you, if not all of you know, U.S. Uh, NECMEC is the designated clearinghouse for apparent child pornography in the U.S. reported by the U.S. based online service companies. So since 2002, a little bit of a staggering figure as well, NECMEC has reviewed and analyzed more than 65 million photos and videos of apparent child pornography. So this tool, PhotoDNA, is enabling NECMEC to create a list of the worst known images of child pornography that it shares with online service providers so that the providers can then voluntarily disrupt the further spread of those images on their services. Uh, I think that will about do it. I've got a couple more slides, but not uh, of critical importance, just some of the resources that micro Microsoft provides as well. But I did want to spend the bulk of my time uh, to photo DNA. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. I think uh, it was interesting to note uh, that you know there is a push towards technology and innovations, and you are you started with the education part. And uh, what we will also be discussing in this session is how to bring this, uh, you know, the the processes that have already started, the tools that are being offered, and the reporting systems that you have developed. How can we bring it to the masses? You know, the education plays a big role in that. And coming back to the photo DNA part, you mentioned the worst of the worst list, right? Uh, can you clarify wha how many images we are looking at when the already existing signatures that had been put on photo DNA? What range are we looking at? Well, these the I can't put an exact number on it, but these are the worst of the worst, and this is. It's, it's it's difficult to discuss. It's obviously a very sensitive topic, but these are these are images of of child rape. There's no other way to describe it, and they are extensive in number. Just to give you that ballpark number, as I said, from the year 2002, uh, NECMEC has been looking at you know 65 million plus images and videos of, of, of child pornography. They're not all the worst of the worst, but what is qualified is being easily or more readily tracked with photo DNA. Thank you for the clarification. And I, I hope you know the, the process, uh, Facebook is also is integrating uh, photo DNA, we'll hear more about it. And some of the challenges around you know, using videos, how it maybe doesn't apply to videos, or it, can it be applied for videos, we'll come to know about that later. So thanks again. Uh, if you have any questions for Jacqueline, um, you can ask at the Q&A session. So we move to our next speaker, uh, Mr. John Carr uh, from Inaxo, and he will be sharing with us some more information about uh, what the industry is doing in uh, facilitating the child online protection. Thank you, John. <coughs> Hello. Is that working? Yeah. Yeah, good, good. Um, so I'm speaking here on behalf of the European NGO Alliance for Child Safety Online, uh, 
This group was established in 2008 um, by Save the Children Denmark. Uh, it's now uh, managed by Save the Children Italy. And within, uh, within INAXO, we have 19 children's organizations from 19 different countries, uh, one from each country within the European Union. Uh, plus, we have uh, associate members from countries outside the European Union, again, children's organizations, for example, from, uh, from Russia and from Turkey. Uh, and we've all come together because of two things, really. First of all, an appreciation and an understanding of the value and importance of uh, the internet in general, uh, new technologies, the different devices that children and young people can use, the importance of those technologies and devices to enriching young people's lives and in particular enriching the, their educational experiences, their social experiences and so on. And I do want to emphasize that we do very much appreciate and, uh, and value very, very highly that positive role that the internet and the technology can, uh, plays. And we're very supportive of efforts by industry and by governments around, uh, around the world, and particularly by the European Commission, to develop more and more positive content for, for children. Uh, but of course, we are all child protection agencies. All of our work stems from and originates with and is f uh, focused upon uh, dealing with some of the less savoury, the less welcome aspects of children and young people's lives. And in this case, obviously, we're focused on some of the issues that the new technologies can, can, break, uh, can bring up. Just, just three weeks ago, um, I, I'm British, by the way, I live, I live in London, um, but I work for this European-wide uh, organisation. But three weeks ago in, in the UK, our statutory... Uh, telecoms regulator, so th this is an independent agency, it's not a child protection body, it's an entirely independent body, conducted a very, very large survey of children uh, and parents' use of, of new technology within, within the United Kingdom. Uh, now, I expect, although this is a British survey, but I expect it's pretty much the same in most of the developed world, or if it isn't today, it will be tomorrow. Um, because we're all kind of moving in broadly in the same direction. And what, what, this documented, what this documented for the first time was the proportion of three and four year old children, so very, very young children, the proportion of three and four year old children who were going online, who had access to um, laptops, de desktops, and they found that six percent of three and four year olds in the UK had access to a tablet that they were using uh, for, for going on the internet. Now, I just want to make this point. When, when we begin discussing the use of the internet and new technology by three and four year olds, I think it does raise questions about the traditional mantra of media literacy. I mean, what, what does media literacy mean to a, a three year old or a, or a four year old? Um, so, I think we are stretching the boundaries, if you like, of credibility if the only answer that we repeatedly come up with is, well, it's all about teaching the children <coughs> how to stay safe. It's all about, to use Larry Magid, he, he created this phrase, by the way. Uh, we all accept that for teens and for older children, the best filter, the best defense they've got is what's between their left ear and their right ear. In other words, the knowledge and the information that, and the education that we've been able to impart ch to children is always going to be the best possible defense for those children, their knowledge, their resilience. I think when you start talking about three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, that concept starts to be challenged somewhat. Um, and I'll illustrate why um, um, in a minute. Um, 90% of kids in British, uh, in, in the UK, live in homes with an internet connection. 100% uh, of kids at school now use the internet at school. At home, it's moving towards 100% as well. So, so we're, we're living in a world now where the internet, it's, it's completely central to, 
to the way that children and young people live their lives, not just in relation to school, which is obviously a major part of their lives, but also to their wider social life and their family life. And the internet and the devices that can connect to it have become a central communications hub, really, in, in young people's lives. They no longer think of it as being something separate or different or something that they might use occasionally. It's, it's fully integrated into the way they, they think about the world and, and the way they interact with the world. Blimey, that's pretty quick. I'm getting a time warning, and I've only just started. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what we're also beginning to see, uh, and I, I notice on the front of the building here, you've got a big sign advertising the arrival of 4G. Well, you're slightly ahead of us. In the UK, I think it only be, 4G only went operational last week, or it might even be this week that it's going. Uh, going operational but I think the arrival of Wi-Fi again is going to change the nature of the discussion that we're having in the going to have in the future about child protection because in the days when in the days when computers were largely or, or internet enabled devices were largely static <clears throat> when uh, when they were basically big boxes in your bedroom or in your living room or in the library or in your classroom you could just about I don't say I necessarily did, but you could just about argue that there was an important role for parental supervision, support and guidance in helping their children to use these devices that were in a fixed place. Now we're on the edge of a world where internet access and the devices that can connect to the internet are ubiquitous. The internet, the ability to, it, to connect to the internet at very fast speeds, 4G, 3G is not bad, 4G is going to be even better. The ability to connect with fast, high quality links to the internet is going to be everywhere. It's going to be in your pocket, it's going to be in your satchel. And now, in British homes, and again, I'm sure it's the same in many other countries, it's not at all unusual to find children, uh, or to find within a particular house, between a dozen and 18 different devices most of them wireless that can connect to the internet. So think about that, think about that. 12 to 18 different devices that a child can possess, most of which will be wireless or have a, a wireless capability built into them. Some will be produced by Sony, some will be produced by Nintendo, some will be produced by Microsoft, some will be produced by Apple, all of these different manufacturers all presenting their, their technology and their software in a different way. I think we are really testing to the absolute limit the capacity of parents to get their heads around all of these different approaches, all of these different manufacturers' approaches. So I, my point fundamentally is, and this is, gets us to the title of this workshop, we're going to have to see from the industry more and better and easier to use technical solutions to help support parents keeping their children safe in the future. To say that the, to, to, to put it all on the bird, on the shoulders of parents or even to, to, to expect parents to be able to, to grapple with, busy parents in a busy world to have, have to grapple with this multiplicity of different devices and approaches and, and so on from different suppliers and manufacturers I think is, is taking us to the very edge of what's credible. Um, and I'm happy to say that many companies are, are responding in a very positive way, particularly within the European Union. At the moment, we've got the coalition of, uh, called by Neely Cruz and, and also the response of the industry themselves in the ICT Principles Coalition, uh, which, uh, which is evidence of the response that, that, of industry understanding the importance of them coming forward with new, new solutions. So I think there is a lot going on that's very positive from the industry, but I really do think we're at the beginning of a very long, uh, a very long and challenging period. I've been told to shut up, so I will. Uh, thank you very much, John. I think you know it's a shame that we have all these distinguished speakers amongst us, and we can go on for hours. Um, I had to cut off Jacqueline at 15 minutes. Uh, because of the, you know, the time limit, I would really want to give more time for interactions. We can hear about all this as we, you know, in other uh, workshops too. Um, w an important distinction John, John made is that even though education and empowerment and awareness is a very integral part and key element uh, in uh, tackling this issue, 
there are areas, for example, he mentioned very young children who are coming online and whether the education really reaches them. I just want to highlight the fact that in certain situations, when the family is exploiting the child, when images are produced by organized networks, forcefully, how do you address that issue? You know, so reporting of incidences, taking action based on those incidences and the reports becomes absolutely crucial. And it's a tool that can aid law enforcement as well. With that, I pass it on to Susie. Uh, I think she comes from a very uh, you know, pertinent background. She had been very much uh, linked up with child protection work within the GSMA. And from the mandate of GSMA, we know that supporting helplines and hotlines and building those uh, play a very important role. So we will hear more from Susie in her speech. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anjan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you heard, um, I represent the GSMA, which is the Global uh, Trade Association for the mobile phone industry. So we represent uh, mobile phone operators around the world. Um, I work within the public policy team. Uh, and the mobile industry is very committed to all issues related to child online protection. Um, we feel the best approach to this is through collaboration and cooperation with uh, different stakeholders um, within the child protection uh, world. Um, so for example, we've engaged with the Financial Coalition, we've engaged with ICMIC and NICMIC, um, with the IWF in the UK, with the ITU uh, Child Online Protection Initiative uh, on broad issues related to um, making the internet safer. And as we've heard um, from John's comments, the internet is now mobile. Um, but specifically what I'm going to talk about this morning is the GSMA's Mobile Alliance Against Child uh, Sexual Abuse Images Online. Um, this voluntary alliance was founded in 2008 and it brought together all the main mobile phone operators from around the world who came together and said we want to make sure mobile networks are hostile uh, environments to illegal child sexual abuse images. Uh, and this voluntary uh, initiative sees mobile operators committing to a number of things um, in which to, to ensure that the networks remain hostile. Uh, and two of the main um, aspects of the commitments are around notice and takedown. So when uh, an operator is notified by law enforcement, they commit to removing that content in a, in a rapid manner. Um, so that content is not available on, on their services. Uh, and the second aspect of the commitment of the membership to the Mobile Alliance is around uh, actively engaging with hotlines and law enforcement agencies uh, because mobile operators have a, a role to play in that cooperation. Uh, and one of the examples that we've done to further that cooperation is it became very apparent to us that in a lot of uh, countries around the world, hotlines don't exist. Uh, so we cooperated with InHope to develop a toolkit and framework for how to establish a hotline, uh, going through, you know, how do you employ uh, the best analysts to tackle this issue, how do you deal with the issues um, related to child sexual abuse images, how do you cooperate with uh, local charities and child protection agencies. And this has been um, a very valuable exercise uh, for the mobile industry to demonstrate its commitment and to make um, a real difference. Um, because it's one thing to stand up and say that you're committed to fighting something, but it's another to have uh, those words followed by um, direct action. Uh, and we've been um, supporting our members in meeting those, those commitments for a number of years. Um, and it's something that's not widely publicized uh, because I think industry just want to keep their head down and, and do the right thing. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an alliance um, that has uh, made great strides. And now we're seeing other developments globally. Uh, the EU and US have announced their global alliance against, against child sexual abuse images. And I think we're going to be seeing more news on that uh, next month when they launch it officially um, in Brussels. Um, so I think that covers uh, the Mobile Alliance and the main um, points of what the industry is doing specifically with child sexual abuse content um, with law enforcement. 
but I think I'll just sum up with um, making some comments about the future challenges um, because you know we're, we're doing what we can now but as we see technology is changing the proliferation of images is, is growing significantly and we can't stand still you know the technology has evolved rapidly and we've heard about photo DNA and I think there's some great technology out there that we need to continue to get our heads around uh, and understand how we can use that um, to, to fight these images as the way the criminals are disseminating information uh, changes. So I think that's something we, as an industry, should be considering and discussing going forward. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susie. Um, I think, <coughs> you know, the mention of the very fact that you mentioned pipelines and hotlines, and um, it's a, an outcome of what you are committed to. It's, uh, it shows clear, direct action from the industry. Uh, but as, the, tech as the, you know, the number of users grows, as the number of you know, different ways where people are interacting, uh, it's you know, important that we also bring this to the helplines, for example. Uh, for example, apps where people, children can report. Uh, they're using this tool, so we may have to think forward and make them even better than what, you know, how they were first envisaged. But it's really a great tool, great uh, way to bring the reports in. And we know and, um, people are not comfortable reporting to law enforcement directly. And these helplines and hotlines play a very crucial role in bridging that gap. So with the deluge of incidents happening, images thrown in, w law enforcement needs to have this information in time and uh, you know, for them to take action. I think that was very important for us to cover here. Um, moving on to my right, we have, uh, as I said, uh, Larry Magid. Um, he is going to talk about, he's also in the board of NECMEC. And NECMEC, as we know, uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children uh, in the US. Uh, they are the clearinghouse of, uh, for you know, dealing with child abuse images. And they're also involved in the financial coalition which uh, is a process to disrupt the flow uh, of um, you know, money, you know, the transactions that goes for buying those images. And uh, Larry is going to lead us through with that. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much, Anjan. Uh, as as Anjan mentioned, I've been on the board of NECMEC now for about 18 years. And um, prior to joining the board, NECMEC and other uh, anti-child abuse uh, organizations and governments had almost eradicated child pornography in the United States. Uh, prior to the internet, it would come in brown paper envelopes, and we have a very active uh, United States Postal Service Police Department that was very good at intercepting this material and arresting the culprits. And uh, Ernie Allen, our recently uh, retired uh, president, has said many times that, that we almost won. We, we pretty much had gotten child pornography to a manageable level, and then came the internet. Then came a completely new way to distribute uh, this illegal and harmful material. By the way, child pornography is a term we use in the United States. I think in Europe you more correctly, those of you who are European, more correctly refer to it as child abuse images. These are crime scene photographs. Uh, I am a member of the American Civil Liberties Union, which is the most vehement free speech organization in the world, and I have no qualms uh, justifying or, uh, my American Civil Liberties Union membership with my being on the NECMEC board because when it comes to child abuse images, we are not talking about free speech. Uh, we're talking about uh, crimes against children. And uh, uh, there is just absolutely no justification in any country in the world, including America, which has a quaint local ordinance, which we call the First Amendment, uh, that even our First Amendment uh, doesn't and should not cover uh, the perpetuation of these uh, horrendous crimes against uh, the most vulnerable citizens. And that includes citizens who live in the United States who are being exploited and citizens who live in other countries, including perhaps many of the countries represented in this room, who are being exploited globally by people in the United States and people in Europe and people throughout the world. So this has become a global problem. No longer can a postal inspection service in the United States or any other country uh, easily intercept uh, materials at the, at the doorstep. Uh, they are traveling globally at the speed of uh, fiber optics around the world, and that's why it is so important that this fight be done on a global basis. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Microsoft for the incredible contribution of photo DNA. 
uh, it's really helped a lot because prior to photo DNA, in order to match a picture, so what, what happens at the NECMEC, and by the way, I don't officially speak for the organization. Uh, I'm a board member, I'm not an employee, but uh, I, I have many times visited the analysts and worked with them. What, what they will do is they, if they get a new piece of data, if they get a, a new image comes in or an image comes in, they need to match it against their database of millions and millions of images. Uh, first thing to know is, is it a new image? Is a child being exploited now at this very moment that we need to go out and send the police? Or is this an image that may have been circulating for 30 years that is still a crime but takes on a different priority than a child who is in the process of being exploited? So they need to immediately figure out that very, very critical piece of information. Prior to photo DNA, in order for them to use a computer-generated match, the images had to be absolutely identical to the bit level, which means if there was a single pixel that was, uh, that was modified, if the photograph had been reduced or enlarged in any way modified, hashtags didn't work. Photo DNA, the pictures can be even slight, not only can they be changed from a pixel level, even if the person maybe tilts their head or a slightly different position, they can still often make a match. It's not perfect, but it is a long way past where we were just a few years ago. So that's an amazing contribution. I also want to congratulate Facebook for, I believe, being the first social network to employ photo DNA uh, and to make sure that it is using it as a way of protecting its own members and children around the world from being exploited by people who are using the, the Facebook service. Facebook, Microsoft, Google, and virtually every other responsible uh, internet service provider in the United States reports all of these images to the National Center Cyber Tip Line, uh, where analysts work to make sure that uh, vulnerable children are being uh, protected to the extent possible. Um, my history with, with NECMEC just quickly began in 1994 when I wrote a booklet called Child Safety on the Information Highway. And many of you have probably seen it, whether you've seen the actual document or one of the thousands of uh, copyright infringed versions of it that have floated around the internet for, for years. Even Al Gore, during his 2000 campaign, came out with rules for online safety, which were word for word identical to, to ours. Perhaps that's why he was uh, defeated. Um, but in any case, um, I wrote that book in 1994 based on a hunch, based on what I thought was the issue. One of the things that's wonderful today is no longer do, does a, a journalist have to sit there and imagine what's going on. We have research. We have the Crimes Against Children Research Center in the United States. We have the uh, EU Center out of the London School of Economics and uh, Sonia Livingston and other researchers. We have researchers that are going on in the, middle, in the Middle East. We have data. We know, for example, what the risks are today and what the risks are not today. We know, for example, that typical children, typical relatively healthy children, are not particularly vulnerable to predators simply because they're on the internet. A 14-year-old surfing the internet may be approached by a predator, but the statistical odds of her or him being harmed by that predator are lower than them being harmed by a religious leader, by a police officer, by a teacher, by a doctor, or for that matter, even their own family. 80% of children who are sexually exploited, at least in the United States, are exploited by someone they know from the real world. Although it happens online, and when it happens, it is absolutely horrendous, it is very, very rare. That doesn't mean it's less serious, that doesn't mean we shouldn't pay attention to it, but it means that we have to look at the entire range of risks and put our resources in a broader sense. That ranges from including predation, which as I said is statistically unlikely, it ranges from things like bullying and harassment, reputation management, helping children understand that what they post online can affect their uh, college uh, admissions, can affect their job prospects, can affect future relationships. Uh, again, bullying, harassment is a very big issue around the world, but also, of course, protecting those who are being excluded through child pornography. Um, in order to protect the most vulnerable young people, I absolutely agree with John Carr that as strong as I am around parental education, and Connect Safely is all about parental education, that's what we do. We don't enforce laws, we don't even get involved in child pornography as an organization, but we know that there are vulnerable people who are going to be at risk for a variety of reasons. Age is one of them. It is, you're absolutely right, John, a, a two-year-old digital citizen is very ill-equipped to protect herself or himself, whereas a 13-year-old with proper education and good social status, a standing in their community, and excellent parenting, 
uh, from uh, functional families is very likely to have the resilience to get through a number of issues. But when we talk about vulnerability, we also need to look at a much wider range than just age. We need to look at mental health status. Uh, there are children who are emotionally extremely vulnerable. Uh, we need to look at the entire range of psychosocial images. So as we consider protecting children and as we consider dealing with issues, we need to understand where these children are coming from. Very quickly, a couple of things. I'm running out of time. Social reporting is a very good tool. I'm sure Richard will talk about it. It is not only cheaper for companies like Facebook, but that's not the reason they do it. It is more effective. Peer, getting peers involved. Don't assume that just because we have smart people like John Carr and, uh, and Anjan and, and people, my colleagues at NECMEC, out there protecting children, that protection always comes from authorities. Protection comes from peers, it comes from communities, and it comes from community moderators, and it comes from the ground up. That is the only way, really, ultimately, you can provide widespread. We don't have enough police in the world to protect every child, but if we can get people conscious of it and reporting it and protecting each other, uh, we will have a much safer situation. I'm also very optimistic about a global solution to reporting lines thanks to simultaneous translation technology. We have a long way to go, but I was very pleased that uh, NTT Docomo in Japan just this week announced technology where you can pick up a cell phone and speak in Japanese and somebody can be listening on the other end in Chinese or English or another language. It's crude, it has a long way to go. But as that technology gets better, it means we can have global helplines and deal with uh, people from around the world regardless of language issues. We're not anywhere near there. Uh, finally, again, pointing to Facebook, the social graph, understanding that when you analyze dangers and analyze situations, we have a lot more data. Big data gets a lot of criticism. I was at a conference last week in Uruguay where everybody was worried about big data. Big data can also be protective. If we learn to understand the databases, we learn to understand the information that we have at our fingertips with these massive uh, information uh, sources that Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, others have, used properly and used legally without violating people's rights, it can be enormously useful in both prevention and apprehension of criminals. So uh, I do think that we have a very good future in terms of child protection. Thanks very much, Larry. I think that was uh, very informative and you covered a breadth of issues. Um, I don't know, can you hear me? I, okay. Um, and again, he reiterated what John said and we mentioned earlier that um, you know, on top of education, we need the correct framework, we need the right tools. And um, he made also that distinction how photo DNA uh, makes a huge difference uh, in identifying those images. Um, I just want to add to that saying that even though um, these tools are unique and they're very good uh, in detecting known images, we still have this gap when new images are created and they're uploaded. And what do we do? How do we use the social tools? How do we use our services to turn things against offenders? How do we use our technology to s reduce the time which, you know, when that offense is committed, when these images are uploaded? Uh, uploaded and they're reported. I think that's what we are trying to find a solution and see what technology industry is doing. Um, we also have, you know, the social networks we know uh, reaches out to so many people, uh, to a huge number of people. Uh, it, it, on one side, it gives the offenders the reach. It also gives the society, the community, the reach to tell law enforcement. So. In that, on that note, I would uh, pass the floor to uh, Richard Allen uh, to take us through what Facebook is doing currently to protect children. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Anjan. And I'm, I'm very happy uh, to try and um, do that in a few minutes and, and very much following on from um, 15 minutes. Oh, that's good. That's better. 12 minutes. I'll keep it as short as I can because I know there'll, there'll be questions. I very much wanted to pick up on, on um, uh, Larry's comments and really try and do three things. One is to talk about reporting systems and our, our experience of reporting systems, and in particular, operating those at scale, um, the kind of scale that we have to offer uh, systems for when we're dealing with a, a billion users around the world in, in multiple countries. Uh, and then to talk about some of these automated methods that Anjan referred to that 
that start to become possible. So it's really using that um, drive towards innovation that we have as a company when we're producing our products uh, to uh, use th those same technological skills uh, in the interest of child protection on our service. Very much driven by the fact that um, our goal is to offer a safe service, one in which uh, everybody feels comfortable uh, and one, one which, uh, again, to pick up on the, the GSMA uh, point, one which is not a comfortable environment for those who wish to do harm, especially those who wish to do harm to children. Um, so I'll go through those, and then I just want to set out a, a few of the public policy questions that I think are raised by this, because there are everything you do in technology and everything you do in social networking in particular raises public policy questions. And I think there are some important ones here that we as the technology companies can't resolve, but we need governments to give us guidance around, um, and I'll set up some of those in closing. Thinking about reporting systems, I think of them very much as a, a pyramid, uh, the kind of issues that are brought to us. So at the base of the pyramid, we have a mass of issues that essentially can be resolved between individuals using our service. So I'll use the example of a report of a photograph on our service. So the great mass of reports of photos that we get are actually somebody saying, I don't like that photo, it's unflattering, it's from the wrong side, uh, I, I look ridiculous, uh, I need you to remove that photo. Now, the best solution for that kind of photo report um, is uh, one of our social reporting tools, which is to tell the person who posted it. The person who posted it is your friend. By definition, they've posted a photo and notified you about it. Uh, you were in the photo. You were physically present with them when they took it. Um, if you say to them, I don't like that photo, it's unflattering, in the vast majority of cases, two things happen. Firstly, they take the photo down. Uh, which is important, and secondly, they learn that you don't like photos like that, so they don't post them again. So we get the, the immediate situation resolved, and we have an important uh, educational lesson for the person who, photo, uh, who, who, who uh, posted the photo. That doesn't need to involve Facebook. It doesn't need to involve any third party. It certainly doesn't need to involve law enforcement. It's a regular day-to-day -day transaction. And so our systems try and get all of those user-to-user -user, uh, situations resolved between the users concerned. The next layer at the pyramid, I'd say, are issues where um, the report relates to something more substantial, where the individual also wants to involve a third party. So again, that same photo may be more than an unflattering photo. It may be part of a campaign of bullying or harassment of that individual. And so we think in those circumstances, what's most important is that somebody in the real world environment of the individuals concerned is made aware of it who can help. And so the social reporting tool offers you the opportunity to share that report, the photo, the comments, whatever the content is that was disturbing to you with a third party of your choosing. And that may be your parent, that may be a teacher at school, uh, but we're encouraging people to share the content and share the issue with somebody who can help resolve it. And again, uh, through that process, we find many situations can be resolved effectively. Um, those photos could have been reported to us, we could have taken them down, but that if the bullying situation continued and there was no intervention on the ground, then you're just going to get the same thing posted over and over again. So that intervention of a third party resolves the situation. The next level would be those, those situations which can't be resolved between the individuals. They need to be reported to Facebook. And that's somebody persistently posting content photos in violation of our terms of service. For example, we ban uh, nudity and pornography on the site. So somebody who's just posting, if you like, uh, legal pornography uh, on Facebook repeatedly uh, that needs to come to Facebook so we can both remove the content and potentially remove the user if that's required. And then the next level at the top of the pyramid, the smallest number of reports are those which do need to go to law enforcement. So something like a child abuse image, um, you know, the only way really to deal with that uh, is that it gets reported uh, to us so that we can report it to the National Center for Missing Exploited Children. They can refer it to the local law enforcement agency in the country of the person who posted the content. Um, and then law enforcement intervention can take place and we can get that person off the system. Um, and there are other things, I mean, as well as child abuse images, I think the, the EU Kids Online um, survey uh, showed us that things like suicide and self-harm actually are top of mind for many parents and many children. Um, and so as well as thinking about content that needs to go to law enforcement agencies, we also think, for example, of uh, suicidal content that may need to be reported to a local suicide assistance agency and again, may actually need to go to the police for them to intervene directly on the ground. So the reporting side, we think there's a huge amount we can do with that kind of pyramid structure. And the, the crucial thing from a, a person-centric point of view is that the person who has the problem gets their report to the right person who can actually help them. It's in nobody's interest for that report to go to the wrong place. And a lot of our effort is focused on that. 
that also needs to be backed up by educational efforts, and I'd say th those take place at two levels. There's the, if you like, the big educational projects. Um, so we're working in, in Germany with Jutta's organization uh, uh, to, to think about how we can use our tools uh, ourselves, how we can use social media to educate people about how to use social media safely. We're working with FOSI on the platform for good. But it's also what we call micro-education. So we've looked at uh, what we call educational checkpoints, and that's where somebody has been posting content that breaks our rules. We've had to deal with it. When that person next logs on, they get a screen that explains to them the rule that they broke, uh, that they mustn't do it again, and may give them a penalty, for example, 24 hours when they can't post anything, in order that they should understand uh, in that contextual way uh, with a piece of micro-education uh, how to behave in a more responsible manner on the platform. Thinking in terms of the second part of this, which, which is the use of technology to create um, uh, scalable solutions for detecting. I'd say it's more on the detection side of things. Um, as Jacqueline explained, we do use uh, photo DNA from Microsoft, and that, that we think is important. It raises some really interesting questions where I'll come on to in the public policy questions, which is, as far as we're concerned, we deployed photo DNA because it passed a, a particular test, and the test is that the technology, we believe, is necessary and proportionate to the offense that's being committed. So that's a classic test that you apply under European Union law, thinking about um, any breach of privacy. And there is, to a certain extent, a breach of privacy. We are scanning people's photos and making a judgment. But in deciding to deploy that technology for that purpose, our view is that it is necessary and that it is proportionate to the offense committed. And that doesn't mean that scanning all photos for other purposes would necessarily pass that same test. And sometimes in this debate, a really big public policy question is raised, which is, if you deploy photo DNA, then you must deploy technology to detect illegal copyright material or whatever else. No, uh, and these are separate decisions based on an assessment of the necessity and proportionality of the particular technology for the particular problem you're trying to tackle. And it may be you deploy similar technologies for multiple purposes. It may be you come to a view that actually it isn't necessary, but clearly with this particular offense and this particular technology, we think it passes that test and we've chosen to deploy it and others will take their own view. Um, the other major area that we can look at are, are the, the sort of measures you use for anti-spam. So, so we have measures, for example, again, just these are normal protection measures. We don't want people creating fake accounts on our service, uh, joining Facebook, and then spamming everybody else. Um, so the, you know, the classic thing, somebody joins, uh, it's a, a guy who joins, he sends a 1,000 friend requests to women and 999 are rejected. That's not somebody we want on our service. So we have systems in place to detect that behavior and, and remove that person. So again, the question there is how far can one extend those techniques? Uh, and clearly, technically, it's possible into other forms of detection. And again, raises another set of public policy questions, classically around the balance between privacy and safety. Um, we think we should have that debate. Um, we would welcome guidance from policymakers who, who say to us both things. I mean, in many countries, we get uh, the privacy regulator saying, hey, you shouldn't be doing things like this. And we get law enforcement saying, you absolutely must do things like this. We need that public policy debate to understand where that balance lies. And again, just as I said with the images question, the fact that you do this kind of measure for child protection doesn't necessarily mean that you should do it for purposes which we will probably disagree with, like detecting political dissidents. We think you can make that distinction that we can use this technology uh, for child protection purposes without necessarily using it for other purposes that people may be less comfortable about, but that requires that public uh, policy debate. Uh, and then just the final question uh, around on the public policy sphere is really the capacity of the agencies we're dealing with. And, and this is, again, a big question for public policy makers. Um, if we can detect things that are going on, we can detect material and we take it to law enforcement and they have no capacity to investigate. And we understand why. It can be quite technically complex. It's typically multi-jurisdictional and multi-jurisdictional investigations are expensive. The offender is in one country, the victim's in another. Um, if the victim is not in your country as law enforcement, maybe it's not a top priority. And again, I think we need a very open debate with law enforcement about what kind of things they want referring to them and what kind of assistance we can give them to make those prosecutions straightforward when, when they're going to happen. Uh, um, so I think those are the last points. Three big public policy questions uh, around scanning of images, around using data techniques generally to detect the bad guys uh, and keep them off your service and, and the extent to which that's privacy invasive. And the third area is really the capacity of the agencies we're working with as our services get bigger uh, to deal with the kind of reports that we might pass on to them. I hope that's helpful. Uh, thank you.
Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, I think you, you cover, you <coughs> hit the nail on it. Um, here, we, um, we, we it kind of ended in a note, we ended uh, with this public policy discussions, you know, some of the nuances, uh, both coming from the technology industry and uh, uh, how far technology industry can go, you know, uh, the, the balance between pr privacy and child protection and uh, how far technology can aid in detection and getting into the life of people in, in, in a way. Uh, so these are um, issues that we, we we probably need to discuss. Uh, we have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes for question and answers. I, I think we can extend by five more minutes if if, if you all feel free uh, to stay around. Um, we have had uh, different presentations from our speakers. Uh, we looked at technology solutions. We looked at uh, the you know, the issue around child abuse images, uh, the, the gravity and the severity of the crime um, that educational efforts alone cannot address. And we, are, we also looked at what the industry is doing globally to help us, um, help all of us in tackling some of these problems. So with that, um, I would take uh, questions from the floor. I have the lady here, uh, the gentleman here, Julia, so uh, please introduce yourself and, um, and ask, you know, if you are directing your question to a particular, oh, okay, over there. So we have one, two, three, four, and five. Please, okay, thanks, Jim. Um, oh, okay. Uh, if, um, please identify your name and direct the question to the speaker who you would like to, to respond. working hello my name is my name is Amelia Andersdotter I am a member of the European Parliament on behalf of the Swedish Pirate Party um, I have maybe not so much a question as more a general observation um, what would you do about false positives in terms of photo DNA um, photo DNA might be very well at very good at identifying some some materials uh, but we have experiences from automated notice and takedown procedures in the past where actually we've had big problems with false positive pos positives, which does create a problem for freedom of speech. Um, in terms of Facebook making the judgment of what is proportional and what isn't, surely the reason that we talk about the state of law and uh, human rights and kind of integrity of judicial systems is because we have impartial actors making assessments in the courts of what is right and what is wrong and not actually Facebook and it's not even Monsanto or s some other multinational corporation. Um, I think that the CEO coalition that was brought up by John Carr as an example of a good measure by the European Commission is a perfect example of when the legislative institutions are incapable of taking responsibility for making an assessment of what is a proportionate measure to apply in society and what isn't. So contrary to John Carr's uh, praise, I would say that this shows that we have a lack of integrity in the European decision-making process, that we aren't able to appropriately deal with what can be expressed, what cannot be expressed. What do we do, for instance, when nudity is used to make a political point, as, in the, as is the case of Femen, a Ukrainian women's rights movement? Does Facebook remove their images from Facebook? And doesn't that then delegitimize women's rights struggles in Ukraine. Um, you do not have the right in society not to be offended. And statistics consistently show that when you use online reporting tools or hotlines for reporting uh, offending content on the internet, actually a lot of the reports made by, by people in society isn't illegal material. It's just something that is seen as slightly tasteless. But we have the right to be tasteless in society. and We have to have the right to be tasteless. Um, so I guess those were my political points, but also I thought it was very good that it was mentioned that law enforcement is not having resources to investigate the actual crimes and acts of abuse against children. And I think it's kind of symptomatic that we're sitting here talking about how to fight pictures when actually, and I think this was brought up by the NECMEC representative, most children don't suffer from that problem 
and we don't put an adequate amount of resources into addressing the problems that actually face children. So that would be my contribution. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for you know your comments. Uh, can you please clarify the last point that you made? Uh, uh, the children, uh, you know, what are the other forms that, uh, you know, that outside those images, you know, are you referring to uh, the violations, other forms of violations? Uh, sorry, I can't. Hear you. Uh, the last point that you made, can you clarify that? Well, so I think what the NECMEC representative said is that you have here pictures of a crime scene. But in order for there to be a picture of a crime scene, a crime must have been yes. committed. Mm -hmm. And what I'm suggesting is maybe we should tackle that crime rather than the picture of the crime, because it would seem to me that for the child who was offended by the crime, it would be more urgent that the crime itself was addressed rather than the picture. Oops. Okay, yeah. Oh, oh. Okay, I think we I have... I also think there is a research <coughs> project in the European Union now, EU Kids Online, which did investigate what problems children themselves uh, perceive online. Yeah. And it showed that many of the policy discussions that we have around protecting children actually aren't really relevant uh, in, con in, in contrast to the problems that, that children see themselves as having. Yeah, okay. And I think we need a lot more factual basis for the actions that okay, all right. take in this uh, field. You know, I, I have my personal comments uh, about your last statement, which I may come back to later if we have uh, not heard from my panelists. Uh, do you have any particular panelists that can respond to your question, or any of them can? No? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to respond to the photo DNA issue. You're absolutely right. There could conceivably be a false positive, but all a photo DNA positive would match would do would send it over to a human analyst. NECMEC employs a very large team of highly trained people who will then look at the picture manually and make a decision as to whether this is one of the worst of the worst prepubescent exploitation and at that point send it to law enforcement. They will not send an image over purely based on a photo DNA match. It simply gets, of the millions that come through, it, it help, helps them prioritize. I also want to, in a sense, agree with at least the, the theme of what you said, and Richard as well, that it is very important that we not use child protection laws to suppress political speech, uh, to protect copyrights, uh, to protect against political extremism, uh, to protect against narcotics use, to protect against alcohol abuse, to protect against adult pornography. These are different issues. These are different social issues. I spoke uh, in Moscow in February, and I was very clear that the Russians were on the wrong track in creating a objectionable content law and using child pornography as an excuse uh, to go after this wider range of content that they objected to, including political dissent. That, is a, that in itself is an exploitation of children. When politicians use ch protection of children as an excuse to suppress speech, they are in fact exploiting children themselves. So I would agree with you on that, although I disagree with you on your comments about uh, child pornography. I do think that there are crimes that are ongoing, that these children are not only exploited in the production of the material, they could be exploited for life by the distribution. They can be re-exploited well into their adult years by the distribution of the material. I happen to disagree. By the way, I'm not a representative of NECMEC. I'm on its board of directors. I don't agree with everything NECMEC said. For example, NECMEC officially came out against virtual child pornography. I disagreed with that position. I think virtual child pornography is a completely different issue than the actual photograph of a real child being exploited. So. I, I agree with the spirit of what you said, but I think you went a little bit too far in your comments about child pornography, although I respect your, your opinion. Thank you. So, <clears throat> sorry, the, the Swedish Pirate Party you say you represent? That's the party that Rick Falkving uh, founded? The, the, the man who, two months ago, published an article, which I blogged about and commented on, in which he said that uh, we should re-legalize, in other words, make legal again, uh, child pornography. Um, and part of his reasoning was very similar to the argument that, that you put forward, that the images, the pictures, it, they're only pictures, and that the pictures are being used by repressive states or by the police to cover a range of other uh, types of censorship. Now, I don't agree with 
states or companies or police forces that use children to justify or disguise other politically repressive regimes or politically repressive uh, measures. But I absolutely, completely reject the idea that it is not important to deal with the pictures. Of course, we would all rather we lived in a world where the abuse of children did not happen in the first place. And of course, we must put all of our efforts into ensuring that that happens. But that does not mean that we can ignore or minimize or in any way accept it is not important to deal with the consequences of that abuse. Let's not forget, the great majority of children who are sexually abused do not have pictures of that, image, of that abuse reproduced. Most sexual abuse does not appear on camera, doesn't appear in videos. A proportion of it does, and we now know because of the numbers and the research that we're doing that the, num that the quantities of those images in circulation on the internet are gigantic. And what they do, apart from continuing the humiliation of the children, they also help sustain pedophile networks and predatory networks, and they help and encourage and sustain men who will go on in future to abuse more children. So the images are, it's not, it, it's ridiculous to say they're more important than the abuse of the child. That's, a, that's just a wrong way of looking at it. But to imply or even to think for one minute that the images, it's not important to deal with them, I completely and absolutely reject. And I think the problem with photo DNA, by the way, is it's the only product that does what it does. We need more companies to copy what Microsoft have done. And Microsoft deserve a lot of praise for the work and money and investment they put into developing it. I want to see other companies doing the same public spirited thing and produce similar programs to tackle this problem. It's a blot on the internet and it will be until we've dealt with it more effectively. Child pornography was a localized industry on a small scale until the internet came along and it's a continuing blot on the internet's reputation, the fact that we haven't yet been able to deal with it and we, we must do. Thanks, John. I think you captured uh, the essence that I was trying to, you know, convey as well. Um, I know we we can have debates around this that whether the images and I I think you made a very important statement that we shouldn't undermine the the necessity of victim identification, tracking the offenders, uh, supporting the children who are victimized, you know, stopping the crime in the first place. But once the crime has been accomplished, when the output, when you have a product, and that's fueling more demand in some ways, uh, how do you, you, it absolutely needs to be addressed, and I'm, I'm totally with you on that. Uh, I have a comment on this from uh, Richard as well. Uh, I'll try and keep it brief. I just want to pick up on, you made a very important point about who should make a decision. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really important to understand from a company's point of view, we don't exist in a legislative void today. There are, you know, there are very clear legal requirements on us, both from a data protection point of view, but also from a child protection point of view. So when we make a decision, it's our best interpretation of existing legal requirements in the face of a new technology which, com which has come along. And, and you know, c the regulation is not gonna be updated for the new technology, so we have to assess it against the existing regulation. In doing that, you know, when we deploy PhotoDNA, we put a great big blog post up, we told the whole world, and we're very open to be challenged. If, if people want to challenge it, we, we would agree that's the right way to deal with these things. And we are challenged on pretty much everything we do. Uh, people take issues to our regulators in Europe, the, the Irish Data Protection Commission, uh, and those are investigators. So I actually think the system is kind of working reasonably well. Um, it's not a unilateral decision by us to make the law. It's a response by us to existing set of law and a particular technology that we have to make a choice around. Uh, but uh, they could get better, I'm sure, yes. but I, I just don't want people to think it's we're making a decision in the absence of existing legal frameworks. Uh, thanks, Richard, for the clarification. I think, and uh, did you get your answer for the false positives? Do you want to know? I, I think uh, what I can add to uh, what Jack can, sorry, yeah. Um, can we have the next question? Uh, sorry, Julia. so much. Uh, yeah, no, maybe it's easier. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's funny. 
we'll need it for, is this working now? I'm from uh, Together Against Cybercrime. Uh, I have just uh, a number of comments as well. Um, I think we moved a little bit. We discussed a, a lot about um, uh, ch uh, uh, child pornography, sorry, but uh, not mm -hmm. about, w when we speak about uh, child online protection, it's also data protection, it's also privacy, it's also e-commerce issues as well. So it's a more global from uh, my pr from our perspective because we work as well on child online protection. It's more uh, globally complex uh, issues. It, of course, it's very important child online protection uh, and uh, um, pornographic uh, child uh, pornographic content, but it's also a um, very big issue coming, uh, data protection and privacy from our point of view. Uh, what I wanted to say, we need also, I think, to underline the positive uh, use, the positive aspect that bring ICTs for children, particularly for vulnerable children that you, um, the underline the um, use of ICTs by vulnerable children. And specifically for them, it could be a great tool uh, that will, uh, for the integration and even for the uh, protection online. And um, actually we work on child and protection and uh, specifically with vulnerable uh, children. And I would like to say that, um, well, mainly it's a question. We believe that uh, this particular um, target group need a specific approach to be developed uh, when we speak about child land protection. What is your position and views on this? Thank you. Yeah. Anybody? I, I uh, okay. Well, at connectsafely.org, we make a very important distinction between the typical child, whatever that is, the, the, the mass majority of children and the vulnerable child. And whenever we look at data, we always see that it is, generally speaking, a relatively small percentage of children who are sexually exploited, extremely small percentage, uh, a reasonably small percentage of children who are bullied. There is this notion there's an epidemic of bullying. That, in fact, is not true. There is a problem of bullying. It is actually going down, not up. It is actually much lower online than it is offline. But nevertheless, it's a problem of a relatively small percentage, maybe anywhere from 6 to 20, depending on what study you look at, which means that 80% of children are not bullied. And so what by, focus, by, by pretending as if there is an epidemic, it would be as if you were to give malaria medication to everybody who's going to Chicago, but fail to give it to people who are going to very vulnerable malaria areas with, with heavy mosquitoes. And so the problem with the internet safety field in general, I'm criticizing our own organizations here, is that we have created almost a mass hysteria and trying to immunize, immunize the population that doesn't need the immunization, but we fail to immunize the population that does. So what the internet safety field needs to do is work with social service professionals, mental health professionals, medical people, identify the vulnerable population, provide research for those population, and stop scaring the crap out of every parent in the world to think that there's a predator behind every keyboard and that your kid's gonna be bullied towards suicide. Uh, focus on the vulnerable and provide primary intervention, primary education to the masses, secondary education to people who are at risk, and tertiary uh, edu uh, intervention to people who are at very serious risk, which is exactly how the health uh, authorities work, uh, and we need to use that public health model. Mr. John, you have a comment? Does it answer your question? Thank you for the question. In the, um, in the British school system, at any moment in time, two and a quarter percent of all of the children at school uh, will be the subject to what we call a special educational needs statement. That's to say, two and, a, and that's about, uh, I think that's about a quarter of a million children in, uh, in British schools. So that's uh, two and a quarter percent of all children attending school who've been judged to have some kind of learning difficulty or emotional developmental problem or something of that kind sufficient to require them to have extra help safety support provided to them within the school system we then have another kind of group of intermediary children who are not considered sufficiently uh, disadvantaged to require extra resources to be given to the school to help with them but are nonetheless considered to be, at some de to some degree or another, handicapped or with an emotional difficulty or a learning problem. There's then, a, a, under our system, there's then an even wider group. And to cut a long story, cut a long story short, uh, it is anticipated that roughly one in five children 
in our school system at some point or another, whilst they're at school, will be in some state of emotional crisis or need or vulnerability. Now that, and by the way, one in five at school more or less translates into incidences of mo mental health and other difficulties found in the adult population. So in other words, children at school are not that different from, uh, from the population as a whole. Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute that that means one in five children necessarily are vul potentially vulnerable in the way that Larry uh, and Yulia were speaking about earlier. But we're not, I just don't, I don't accept this idea that the number of children is so insignificantly small that anybody else who suggests otherwise is being hysterically scaremongering. Very small percentages on the internet represent very large numbers of human beings. This is not a utilitarian trade-off. We are not here discussing the greatest good for the greatest number. We have obligations to every child. Now, if I was a company like Facebook or Microsoft or Google or whoever it was, and my uh, chief operational officer came into me with a report and put it on my desk and said, hey guys, look at this. 97% of all of our customers are extremely satisfied and happy with everything that we're doing. Isn't that wonderful? If I was a CEO, I would say, yes, that's fantastic. 97% of everybody that we serve has no issues or problems with us. 3% of Facebook, for example, is what, 3 million or 30 million or something like that? Because they've got a billion users. You cannot just say it's scaremongering to worry about 3 million people or 30 million people or whatever the number is. We have obligations to every child, not just some. Thank you. I think that's a very important distinction and it clarifies, you know, that this debate a bit more. Um, Yuta, yes. um, I would just request that I, I would take three more questions. You, uh, gentlemen there, gentlemen at the back, and if we have a little bit time maybe from uh, Urban there, if, if we have time. Please keep your questions to the topic of the discussion because we know ICTs and child protection online covers a wide gamut of issues. We are not getting into education, into you know what are the um, you know different technologies that can help children in understanding. We are not covering those here. Our principal topic is how can technology, how can these services help post-reporting, how, how can they help in bringing these cases better to law enforcement and create education around that? So if you can limit to your questions to that, that would be helpful. Thank you, Anjan. Um, what Larry said gives me the opportunity to draw your attention to the flyers I've spread around because this is about a European project which is all about building resilience of very vulnerable children uh, with social service uh, staff. But my statement tries to build a link between what John said and Bridget, um, because John stressed that parents are overstrained with new technology and are unable to cope with their children's digital education. And uh, we've been talking about technical support built into the services several months ago at the Youth Protection Roundtable. This is what Richard called microeducation, very simple technical means like pop-up windows with warnings going to the children as the users of the services, or even the 24 hours denial of postings, for example. And uh, I think it's, this could be an important way uh, to help parents that are overstrained with the, with the technology. So uh, it can be built into the services, and then it, it would go to all the users, to all the young users. Thank you. Thanks, Jutta, and uh, the gentleman there, yes. Uh, my name is George, I'm a member of the Nexo delegation from Germany, and I'm a lawyer, I'm specialized for the defending of victims of sexual abuse. And uh, Larry, you finished uh, to see uh, there's a good future in child protection in the net. Where do you have this optimism? We see a new development in the pedocriminalist scene. In former times, you needed a picture to come into a network. Uh, uh, neither a picture. Now you need a self-produced picture. And we see lots of offenders doing the pictures in their own family, and then they come into the pedocriminal networks. We have the cloud technology, we have P2P, 
where are the answers of technology to fight against this? I, I think the offenders are always one or two steps before us. And uh, why are you so optimistic? I think they run away from us with the new technology, uh, internet giving them cloud technology. I think there's no answer how to come to the pedophiles in cloud technology now. Well, first of all, uh, you know, I cannot live in a, in, in a world where I'm strictly pessimistic. We have to constantly be striving for solutions. And I honestly believe that even though the pedophiles may be working very hard to expand their technology, there's some very smart people in this room, or maybe engineers working for the smart people in this room and other rooms. Uh, enormous strides are being made. Uh, it is true that we are you know, finding increasing amounts of child pornography, but we are also intercepting more, um, and, and the technology is advancing. I just honestly believe also the social consciousness is advancing. Uh, despite our, our friend from the Swedish par uh, Pirate Party, uh, globally we're seeing more and more countries outlaw child pornography, more consciousness about it, and I honestly believe that things will get better. I do not think things will get perfect. And I actually agree with my friend John uh, that if one single child in the world is being exploited, then we have to put every effort into protecting that one child. Uh, but I don't see the situation getting worse. I see uh, technology and legal authorities and social pressure uh, beginning to erode it. I know for a fact that when it comes to uh, things like bullying, we are getting better. I, I can't say for certain on the child pornography side. I would have loved to end on that note, on a positive note, uh, but I promised a gentleman at the back uh, to have a question, and probably that would be the last question for the day. If, keep it short, please. Um, yeah. Hello, I'm Martin. I'm here with the Web of Tomorrow is Yours, which is one uh, side event uh, to IGF, which seeks to bring youth activists to the IGF. And um, yeah, maybe not as positive in my note here. Um, b because I've worked uh, very much with uh, abused children in the past, and um, my fear is that the uh, methods that are used and applied, the tools uh, that are applied, uh, they are telling actually the children that are abused in the, in, in the case. And you spoke a lot about uh, big data and uh, data retention, how you are screening a lot of data. And the problem that uh, these children feel is that they were invaded in their privacy, that they were robbed of their deci uh, decision to share whatever they want uh, with themselves. And the children that I work with um, were exclusively not using Facebook or any uh, other social network anymore. They were refraining themselves from sharing any data uh, to avoid uh, any further sharing. And I'm afraid that this also is reflected in the measure measures that is used to protect them, in fact. So that I'm not sure that the children that I work with would be really feel represented or felt protected by the measures that are proposed here. Uh, um, I mean, we should follow up uh, as we walk out the room. I'd be very interested in that. I mean, it is a question of judgment. There are, we're very clear we face competing demands. Uh, people want to be free to do what they want to do on our services and not be under surveillance. But they also complain very strongly when um, the services go bad. And we've seen experiences of services uh, you know, go bad because they've been taken over. Or you know, people's experience when they go on there is so poor because of the content that they're faced with, uh, that the uh, contact that's made with them, that the service doesn't work either. So for us it is, uh, I'm a moderate, I guess, in, my, in all sorts of things, but there is a kind of happy medium that we're trying to get to which says, we do enough to keep you safe and we're very transparent about it and, and we keep our service good. We don't let it go to the dark side, but at the same time, we minimize the amount of work we need to do uh, to give you the maximum freedom to express yourself. It's not an easy balance. I'd be very interested to talk to you more about uh, how the community you're working with, it seems, thinks we've got it wrong already. Um, but I think we need a more in-depth discussion. So I think um, that brings us to, you know, we are ending a, in, a, in a kind of dubious note here because these discussions can follow up and uh, we don't have time to really get into depth. But I really want to leave the session with a positive note. I Taking your point, you know, that it does... Uh, raise some issues around, you know, what is legitimate, what is illegitimate around filtering privacy issues. But I do see the industry, the progress that has made what my panelists has suggested, that we are, unless we put in these efforts, you know, we absolutely need to stay committed. Um, 
applaud and congratulate all the work that has been done so that they can be done even better. You know, we don't want to uh, go backwards. We want to move forwards. And we have heard from our partners, our speakers, that you know, we need a collective and collaborative effort uh, considering and recognizing all these special needs of children. So I would like to conclude the session here and thank all my panelists and all my uh, audience here for being a very patient speaker and uh, staying 10 minutes over. So thank you very much. And I would like to thank my remote moderator, Jim Pendergrass, even though we didn't have any question, but he was very helpful. Thank you. If anybody's interested in about, uh, at 11 o'clock, we're going to be doing a session on the UN Convention and the Rights of the Child. That, uh, some people may, some of this discussion is going to go on. 11 o'clock, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to.